I am you are watching this. Thank you all so much for joining us for what is going to be a very insightful and energetic and important conversation. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion and then we will open to the audience for questions. And you can post your questions in the chat box on Zoom. You can post your questions on the YouTube live chat or the Facebook live. And do make sure to state who your question is directed at and we will put some forward to the panel towards the end. Um, so I am your host, well, I'm your chair. I'm chairing this discussion today. My name is Renee Landell. I am a PhD student in the School of Humanities at Royal Holloway University of London. Um, and I wanna take the time to recognize and make clear that this has, this has got to be an ongoing conversation. We cannot cover and address essential concerns, all of the essential concerns and questions in one sitting. And so I encourage everyone to continue attending events like this and be an active voice inside and outside of these spaces. And we have an absolutely phenomenal lineup of panelists um, whom I'm very excited and honored to be in conversation with this afternoon. And I know you are all excited, hopefully as I am, to welcome them. Uh, but before I do, I must mention and thank the Museum of British Colonialism who are hosting this wonderful event. Um, they are a volunteer-led collective based in Kenya and the UK. Uh, the museum was established in 2018 and the volunteers work to unearth and provide a space of hypervisibility for suppressed, destroyed, underrepresented histories relating to British colonialism. And you can find out more about the museum and about their work via their website, which is www museumofbritishcolonialism.org and also via their Twitter page, they're on Twitter at Museum of BC. And do feel free if you're tweeting to use the hashtag ImaginingMBC. They also have a forthcoming anthology in the works which will invite contributions from around the world on the same question we are asking today, what can a museum of British colonialism look like? And so do make sure to follow them across their social media so that you don't miss out on more information about that. Um, and they have done an, an impeccable and incredible job in planning and organizing this event and bringing us all together today. And so I extend my gratitude to them. And so um, we're gonna get on with the discussion. Uh, we, we have a schedule, time schedule, and we don't want to go over that. We're hoping not to. Um, so I'm going to introduce now our wonderful panelists. We have William Dalrymple, who is a historian and the author of The Anarchy, which I believe is out now. Is that right, William? Correct, it is. Amazing. We also have uh, Priyam Varda Gopal, professor of English and the author of Insurgent Empire, which I believe is also out now. Yes. And we also have Chow Tayana, who is a Kenyan-born digital heritage specialist, a digital humanities scholar and co-founder of the Museum of British Colonialism. And finally, Nana Ayim, an art historian, filmmaker and author, whose book I believe is also available now uh, entitled The Godchild. So you can tell by their CV that they are well accomplished and it's such a delight and such an honor to be in discussion with you all today. So we're gonna dive right into the discussion. As we all know, Britain is a nation that vehemently and continually denies its history and projects, you know, this myth of a benevolent colonial slave system, sorry, system, which uh, civilized parts of the world, parts of the world which they believed and probably still believe needed saving. Um, and so William, this is my first question, it's directed to you. Very recently, you highlighted the need for there to be a museum of colonialism in the UK, which highlights you know, the historical evils of empire uh, so that children can know and learn the truth. Your statement garnered much responses on social media with many agreeing with you and some even disagreeing with you. Um, and it's great that you can be a part of this conversation today. Um, so I'm coming to you first to ask you, why do we need a museum of British colonialism and what should this museum look like? Uh, <laughs> that'll take an hour to answer either of those questions. But the, I mean, straight off, the first answer is simply that it's not taught in British schools. Yeah. We have a bizarre situation, which 
anyone outside the country, I think, finds hard to believe. And, and which, uh, uh, once you think about it, is totally baffling. Uh, that the British history curriculum does not teach almost anything about the British Empire. I had two kids that did uh, just come through British education system, um, having started off school in India. And they learned more at primary school in India about the British Empire than they did in 10 years uh, of education, right up to a Yeah. And in the, in the system, it is possible for individual uh, uh, history teachers at A-level to take modules in imperialism. It's not that it's, it's not allowed, but it isn't compulsory. And therefore you can pass through 10 years of, uh, of British education and simply not know about basic facets of British colonialism. Uh, not even the kind of, you know, the relatively rarefied stuff like the wiping out of the Caribs or the extinction by hunting parties of the uh, uh, the native Tasmanians who were entirely wiped out uh, and, and of whom there are none left, the genetic gene pool is gone. Um, but even major stuff like who conquered India uh, in the 18th century, which was the subject of my last book, which is of course not the British government, but a trading company. And, the fa and what's right. I think very instructive about the the, the, the story of the East India Company is there is absolutely no pretense even at the time that this is a civilizing mission or bringing railways or uh, an attempt to establish universities in, 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 in uh, benighted parts of the globe. This was conquest for the profit of shareholders. There's absolutely no way you can spin that other than that. It is, uh, it, it's completely unarguable that the only reason the East India Company was there was to make a profit for its directors, its shareholders, and, and its own, uh, own officials. Um, and so it's a very good and stark way of highlighting the idiotic presumption that the empire was about anything else. Mm. Uh, because you know, while there are, there are moments in, in the later Victorian empire when you can point to hospitals and museums and what have you, the East India Company, which, which was there for 250 years, as opposed to the mere 90 years of British Raj, never saw its job to, uh, to do anything like that. And this becomes particularly stark when you get in 1770, quite soon into the, uh, uh, the uh, soon after the company has become a territorial power, you get a massive famine in Bengal, where around at least 3 million people die. Now, during that, Famine. The famine extends into areas where Indian officials uh, are, are still operating. And there you get quite orderly transfer of grain from places where there are uh, 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 granaries full to bursting, uh, being shipped down to places where there's none. But the East India Company does not send, set up one single soup kitchen. They just let three million people starve. And then they sent out their sepoys to gather taxes in full. There's no tax remission. So even if you uh, didn't starve to death, uh, you uh, would be hung, uh, even if you were starving, if you didn't provide your taxes in full. So gibbets were set up and the uh, East India Company Army, which does have full granaries and, and whose troops are uh, well fed, go out and hang uh, half the surviving population. So you, stuff like this is sort of crucial and basic yeah. central stuff that every English child should know. Uh, yeah. and, and tragedy is it isn't just India. You know, I've heard British people flatly deny the potato famine to Irish people. Uh, I've heard, you know, endless travesties of, uh, of, 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 of the history of slavery. Uh, and in a sense, it's not the fault of, of the young people who don't know this because they're just not taught it. So and it's not just, just sorry, the go ahead. Story. So, so in terms of what a museum could look like, a museum of British colonialism, you're talking about these violent histories, um, you know, and how the British Empire have played such an instrumental role. Um, and, and, you know, even after colonialism, we're still seeing the effects around the world. So I want to ask, what do you think a museum of British colonialism could look like? What do you expect to see? 
So I was very, very impressed last year in Washington going to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. And if anybody who's watching this has not been, make it the highlight of your next trip to the US as soon as Trump is out and COVID has faded and the borders are open again. Um, it's an astonishing institution. And I've met Br right-wing Tory British friends that have gone there and gone back and gone back and gone back because they were profoundly moved by what they saw. I mean, it's the whole story of the slave plantations, the, the, uh, the Atlantic Passage, uh, the, um, it's, it's such an extraordinary, brutal, terrible story. And this museum tells that story so well, so movingly, it documents, there's, there's not, what's interesting about it is it, it, is, it isn't full of sort of major artworks uh, or rare objects like the other museums in Washington. It it's, it's, tells its narrative very largely through text with a few objects, uh, a, you know, a, a, a slaver's whip, a few shackles, um, uh, and and so on. Registers of of slaves uh, uh, being being put into cargo ships and so on. Uh, it isn't that it, that it's you know an astonishing museum in the way that the Met is astonishing because of the objects uh, which yeah. it displays. It's an astonishing museum because. Not only is it incredibly educative and take would take you at least four or five hours to go around properly and read even a, even a, a good proportion of the text there, uh, but it does so in such a way that it moves you and and it and it's very clever in that by concentrating on personal stories, yeah. uh, it it provides an unanswerable argument really to any bigot that happens to find himself going round, hmm. so um, or anyone or anyone you know prepared to give a you know a uh, you know, a yes, but answer to colonialism or slavery. Uh, 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 what a, or uh, a what about answer? Um, because it's just so moving, and you see people in tears. Uh, it's, yeah. And what's also interesting is that it's self-financing. It is so popular. About only about fifty percent of the audience is African American. At least half at any moment is white, and the, you can see these people just don't know. Them. And so you see really focusing here on on physical presence, stepping into somewhere, a space, um, you know, which which has decolonized or anti-colonial work. Um, and so, you know, you know, the Museum of British Colonialism, they don't actually have a building. So I want to invite um, some of the other panelists in on the, the discussion. Priya, do you think it is appropriate that there be, you know, a building, some a space where people can go in and, and, and experience these true histories? You're muted, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, um, I haven't seen the uh, Museum of African American History in DC, but I have heard that it is excellent. Um, and it clearly is a hugely important intervention in another country where there is a great deal uh, of denial, although I think it's less possible uh, in some ways in the US than it is here. Um, that said, I think that we do need to think about the concept of the museum and what it has done historically and its own connection yes. to the colonial project, which was, um, as Aimé Césaire, the famous uh, poet and writer said, it was you know, about museumizing cultures and rendering them dead. Um, and, uh, you know, he says quite famously, uh, maybe you should have just left the cultures alive instead of sticking them um, into museums. So I would want some kind of acknowledgement um, of the ways in which buildings and objects, uh, and I know that's not what uh, Will is saying, but I'm, I'm just saying that the museum is complicit um, in colonialism, the kind of knowledge that the museum produced about other cultures, the ways in which it fixed them, essentialized them, rendered them dead, these are all things that would have to be acknowledged. So yes. of course it would be great to have a museum with a building which had the same kind of cachet and uh, access as the British Museum. But I also think we need to think about the ways in which um, what Will is talking about in terms of education and public understanding and popular uh, engagement with empire can't only just happen in a building. Um, and I yeah. think we have to think about other ways of making this education public, popular, and accessible. I could imagine, for instance, traveling storytelling, uh, traveling kind of caravans of people going into communities and doing a mixture of storytelling, discussion, uh, you know, 
film, artworks, objects, whatever. But in a sense, the museum has to go out into the world. We do know that in many ways, going to the museum on a Saturday afternoon is a class pastime. It's, you know, middle class kids get taken to the museum. It's not only the case, but overwhelmingly, museums are off-putting to people who don't see themselves as being of a particular milieu. I think that while we might want to think about a building and what it would look like inside and how we might, you know, museumize it as well as anti-museumize it, yes. um, I think we also need to think about other ways, other creative ways of getting the kind of knowledge gaps uh, that Will was just talking about um, addressed in schools, of course, but also yeah. outside, um, outside in the larger world. That's a really interesting point. And actually, I know that we have um, two panelists who are, you know, doing work outside of building in, in a new way. So, um, Chow, you are the founder, one of the founding members of the Museum of British Colonialism, which doesn't have a building. And I'll be interested in hearing what your museum looks like. Um, and then secondly, Nana, I know that you work with different kinds of practices. So I'd love to hear about, about that also. Um, but I'm going to invite Chow into the conversation first. What does your museum look like? Thanks, Renee. I think when I describe the museum, it's not so much about how it looks, but what it represents. Yeah. Um, and for me, a museum of British colonialism, um, and for us and the work we do, is a space that is accessible, um, a space that is visible, uh, a space that is loud, uh, and, and um, to, to use the words of um, the Attorney General, the Colonial Attorney General in Kenya in 19, between 1955 and 1961, he describes the mistreatment of detainees um, here in Kenya as distressingly reminiscent of conditions in Nazi Germany or communist Russia, but then agrees to draft new legislation on, on detention here in Kenya and writes, if we are going to sin, then we must sin quietly. And for me, when I hear that statement, of course, it's alarming. But what I do with it is that I say that if we are going to talk about this sin, then we must do it loudly. And yeah. uh, I think that's what a museum, whether it's in space, one space or many spaces or digital spaces, should represent. Perfect. That's wonderful. And Nana, I'd love to hear a little bit more about uh, the practices um, that you do in your community museum. Um. Thanks, Renee. So, I mean, first of all, I think muse the British Museum is a kind of museum of British colonialism. It's just a little bit um, misnomered. Um, and, and also, it also depends a little bit where the Museum of British Colonialism is, um, which context it's in. So um, I've been working for a couple of years here in Ghana on a mo what I call a mobile museum. Um, so it's a mobile structure that um, I've worked with um, a couple of architects on. The first was DK Osari, and then the second was Latifa Idris, who's a young 25-year-old architect. And we've created together um, a structure that I, the, the first structure we created was actually not so modular. Um, we put it in Accra and then invited community members to come in. Um, and it was such a big success. It was so, um, even beyond anything that I'd imagined, spoke to people, um, it was engaging, it provoked so many questions, so much, opened up so much um, that I thought I have to travel around the country with this. And so um, decided to create a kind of modular museum that you could take apart, put on the back of a truck and then go into communities. And so for the last couple of years, that's exactly what we've been doing. Um, wow. It's taking the museum, rather than people coming into the museum, taking the museum to people, um, and it's been literally the most incredible experience um, that I've had in, in my kind of artistic or curatorial life in terms of engagement, in terms of learning. I've learned so much. Um, we, you know, we, we do different kinds of engagement. One is that we um, work with contemporary artists, to engage um, with interventions. We um, go into people's homes and ask them what's of cultural value to them. What objects do they have? Um, you know, what are the histories that have been passed down to them to kind of also deconstruct this idea of cultural value. There's, but there's some objects in people's homes that are older than some of the objects that I've seen at the British Museum. Um, the stories and the narratives that people tell are so full. Um, um, and so I, in terms of the Museum of British Colonialism, first of all, the, the work that I'm doing here in Ghana is 
deconstructive of the idea of a museum. Um, you know, we have a national museum that was um, erected in 1956, you know, on the eve of, of independence, but it was very much in the imperialist Western model to kind of, um, you know, echo this, this uh, hollow idea of a new nation. It's not a hollow idea, but the kind of idea in itself, the construction of it is hollow because it hasn't worked. Our museum has been closed for five years. Even before that, it was, um, you know, dusty gray. It was a graveyard as lots of museums yeah. can be. Um, and so to think about what is a museum that speaks to us, that speaks to our context, that speaks to our narratives. Um, you know, obviously slavery is a huge, you know, yeah. if not the most um, resonant aspect of, of colonialism. We have um, various forts and castles along the coastline. Um, I was working on one in particular, the Osu Castle. Um, and, you know, for us, that might be our, our museum of British colonialism because, you know, it was, uh, it was built um, by the Dutch and then it's gone through so many hands, Dutch, Danish, um, Portuguese, British, then it became the seat of government. Um, it was captured as well by the Aquamu people. It tells in itself, in its bones, the history of colonialism, the history of slavery. Um, and so I don't know if there's necessarily a need to construct um, a whole new monument to colonialism because there are already so many monuments to colonialism exist. It might be about inhabiting the ones that already exist with narrative um, and, and, and kind of Unve unveiling the skeletons rather than kind of constructing something new. I'm going to invite Chow to. to um, yeah, I, I wasn't sure to raise my hand, so I just awkwardly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, to speak to Nana's point, one of the things that we do here at MBC is to look at history, the word history and the word museum as a verb. Like you history, I history, you museum, I museum, because we see the museum in itself as a process, yeah? and an engagement rather than as a space or a particular destination. Um, and the way that MBC has been functioning is uh, we have no objects, we have no space, and we have primarily been looking at either making archives accessible or creating our own or building our own archive and making that accessible. Um, so when we speak about having a museum and the intention to call our space the Museum of British Colonialism is in itself to contradict the very nature of a museum and to append it and say, okay, what if we completely shift what this looks like and create an alternative space? What does that look like? Um, a lot of our practice has been grounded in, as, as a grassroots uh, organization, a lot of our practice has been grounded in going directly to the communities. And by communities, I mean my grandparents and their friends and my friend's grandparents, you know, how, what does that look like to speak to people who directly live through this experience? What do we miss in the archive? What do we miss when we rely on, you know, the archives primarily to understand colonialism or the textbooks, you know? So yeah. it's, it's a multifaceted process and um, without a destination, I feel like it, it's ongoing and we really don't know when this will end or if, if it will end but we are building a foundation now that perhaps other people can use to create work and to produce content around this, this subject. That's a really important what you've just said. It's like building a framework for others to use. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about how museums are often said to be unsafe spaces that appeal to white audiences. And it begs the question, who are museums for? And, and who is truly, uh, being represented here, you know, or in other words, it's not only the stories that we tell that are important, but also who gets to tell them. Um, Priya, your book, Insurgent Empire, explores how colonial subjects were not merely victims, but also agents of resistance. Why then is it important to dissenter colonial representations and expose uh, the master narrative uh, in museums? So what strategies can museums and galleries put in place to undertake decolonial work? And why is it important to dissenter those colonial narratives? So I would say, um, I, I just slightly rephrase what you just said. It would be interesting to see museums undertaking anti-colonial work um, because the story of colonialism actually needs to be told in many ways through the lens of anti-colonialism. 
why was colonialism resisted and resisted not just in the colonies, but also by people in Britain. Um, you know, there was no consensus on the colonial project. The East India Company uh, was subject to challenge, including parliamentary challenge. So um, it's not as though people were completely comfortable uh, with what happened in the name of the British Empire or the British colonial project. So I think anti-colonialism is the missing uh, term. And I say anti-colonial rather than decolonial, partly because I work within a different tradition. Uh, mm. But I think anti-colonial also gives us a sense of the live and dynamic nature of opposition and criticism. So can um, I get and, you to define yeah. the difference between decolonial and anti-colonial? Oh, I'm not sure right now <laughs> is the best time to do that. I mean, the, the decolonial tradition comes out of the Latin American uh, context. It has very specific references uh, to a particular kind of understanding of both knowledge um, and history. And yes. this, I, I'm not, I'm not um, criticizing it. I'm saying that anti-colonialism is for me the more uh, yes. pertinent term in this context because it refers to praxis. It refers to a kind of ongoing practice of questioning, of challenging, of protesting, of reframing. It's alive. Anti-colonialism is not a thing. It is not a condition. It is not a state. Um, mm. It is a critical spirit. Um, and so for me, anti-colonialism, in, in a way, our whole discussion uh, is yeah. anti-colonial because yeah. it is really challenging established narratives of colonialism. And it is kind of thinking about why was colonialism a problem and what did it do um, that we must now think about undoing. So yeah. um, for me, anti-colonialism, a museum of anti-colonialism uh, wouldn't be about objects. It would be about redoing the story. And of course, as you have already suggested, um, having different voices as part of that story. The interesting thing about the history of anti-colonialism, colonialism is often represented as white versus black and brown um, mm -hmm. or England versus the rest of the world. But mm -hmm. anti-colonialism gives us a sense of how there were connections and affiliations and alliances across the world and also between people in Britain or France or uh, Portugal or wherever and the colonies and how alliances and mutual learning uh, and it's a process I've talked about as kind of reverse tutelage of a, a process of learning from each other was actually fundamental to anti-colonialism. So I would kind of like to see the spirit of anti-colonialism brought to what were for lack of a be better word right now calling museums that we've all flagged a, a certain discomfort uh, with that concept. Um, but yeah, I, I, I forget your original question, Renee, but uh, anti-colonial no, is what I sort of- it. Yeah. yeah, You answered it perfectly. And I actually want to invite uh, Will to respond on this um, when thinking about decentering colonial representations and your idea of, uh, you know, even this ongoing debate about statues and, and museums and and what's your opinion on this, Will? Well, first of all, I'd, I'd say I totally agree with, with Priya. The, one of the most interesting things for me researching uh, the anarchy was the degree of opposition to the East India Company in Britain in the 18th century. You kind of assume that, uh, uh, that you know, they were okay with it. Uh, Back then, that there was a that you know the world was a tougher, more violent place. That uh, that rape, pillage, slavery, and plunder were were kind of you know you know not regarded as quite as terrible as we regarded. But of course, that's not the case. People, if they know the truth, um, will react strongly uh, in favour of justice. And it, I was astonished that 1774, two whistleblowers from the East India Company write the first accounts of what's going on in India. They talk about the uh, degree to which the people of, of Bengal are being starved to death, looted, their, their, their money just being shipped a million pounds at a time, ship after ship, leaving leaving Calcutta and, and arriving in England to buy the big national house, trust houses, which, you know, Colin Firth wades through in his breaches every Sunday evening on, on sort of Masterpiece Theatre or BBC primetime. Uh, and in reality, there was huge demonstrations against the company. Clive, who now sits outside the Foreign Office, swaggering on his uh, uh, on his plinth, uh, immediately between the Foreign Office and Downing Street, standing there still as a symbol. He was he was there were huge demonstrations calling him Lord Vulture, which was the name uh, he had in a play that was put on at the Haymarket. So you get anti-colonial 
Blaze. You get a, a whole page sort of editorials in 18th century newspapers. Again, I hadn't I hadn't realized any of this happened. I, I assumed that uh, everyone thought it was just fine for um, uh, Mira is just coming up on the chat saying follow our campaign, remove Clive. Quite right. <laughs> um, uh, uh, it, it is she's doing amazing work um, getting Clive done. Now, Clive, we, we I think one of the things we could also do in the museum is you kill two birds with one stone. On one hand, you provide a major educational resource uh, to educate people who are otherwise not learning the stuff you know we're getting via bbc via merchant ivory films a very rose tinted version of colonialism where there are no starving people uh, where it's all about uh, elegant ladies and crinolines wafting along similar lawns under parasols and uh, smiling maharajas are playing croquet and, and sort of gin fizzes are being sort of served and you know that whole vision of, of the kind of you know the ultra romanticized raj which only really began to appear on British screens in the 70s and 80s. It was a new, I mean, it's very interesting, it's kind of new creation as late as that. Uh, this this bowdlerized, unviolent, uh, uh, pretty version of colonialism, which got lapped up and, and, you know, created a sort of fashion revolution in the 80s during the kind of height of Diana hairdos. People were wandering around in, particularly in, Priya of Cambridge, I remember all sorts of people sort of, you know, wearing jewel in the crown chic. That whole, that whole romanticization of, uh, of empire and the Raj and colonialism can be chipped away and, and, and tackled by a well-told narrative, a textual narrative in, in, in museum. Um, but you, you also have somewhere where you can put all the colonial guddle lying around the country uh, and, you know, you, you can prioritise things. Uh, I mean, you know, first of all, let's start with the war criminals sitting in Northern Ireland uh, uh, on a plinth uh, in the middle of uh, in the middle of Belfast is John Nicholson, who uh, was proud of flaying rebels alive in the middle of a shopping centre in Glasgow. There's Colin Campbell, Lord Clydemuir, as he was called, uh, given a peerage for uh, make for, for blowing sepoys from the mouths of cannon in 1857 in India, making them lick up uh, the blood on the floor of the Bibigar and Cornport, then sewing them in pigs. I mean, you know, unbelievable horrors. Uh, the equal of any uh, kind of Nazi fantasy. But uh, these guys still remain on their place. You, you could put them in this museum and give a plaque that tells the whole story. Uh, about yeah, the, the simple truth is 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 the uh, is all you need to put there. Uh, you can use their own writings, uh, yeah. their own letter. Uh, so you don't have to give it any spin. Uh, it's quite horrific enough just by uh, digging out the the original letters. So I I, I think that you absolutely what Priya said. I think that you can um, that the history of anti-colonialism uh, is surprising, yeah. uh, and it's also you know in, in the if, if this if this museum if there is a version of this museum uh, in Britain as well as as well as one in Kenya or as well as one in Ghana, uh, if this becomes an international franchise of the four British who so have various versions of it everywhere, um, you give something that uh, you know you, you can make the anti-colonialism something that British kids can relate to and be proud of, uh, rather than uh, you know the the old. Um, heroization of, of the monsters and, and the war criminals. Hmm. Can I just comment on, on yeah. that briefly? Um, I think, um, William, I have a, a vague memory of, of uh, arguing you with you about, uh, about what happened with Colston. Um, and I think it was your view then that uh, there should be a park or a museum and Colston should be moved as along with Clive and so on. You know, and and, and in, in one sense, one could say, yeah, that, that's fine. You, um, but I think there's a danger that we museumize both colonialism and anti-colonialism. And the way I saw it is that young people pulling down the Colston statue might make you and me a little bit nervous, but um, that's history in action. That's young people wanting to say this statue does not represent us. Um, and, Again, one might say, well, it should be done democratically through petitions or whatever, but actually history isn't neat. As, as you know, uh, actions uh, emerge, they are spontaneous, they, they come, there are ruptures. History is made through ruptures. 
So I would be a little bit reluctant to say, well, let's have this genteel little warehouse where we put all our embarrassments and we can put a write up and anyone who wants to go and see them can go and see them, but we'll uh, cleanse the public sphere, not just of the statues, but of people dynamically saying, we're gonna push the statue down and stick it into, the, into its head into the sea. Um, so I think we also need to be, while respecting museums and what museums can do, we also need to be respectful of protest in action, anti-colonialism in the present day. I, I wouldn't disagree with that at all. And, and I think that I, um, I missed how far that was a, a, a catalytic moment. It changed history, uh, uh, the Colston thing. And, and there's no question that it, uh, um, it's moved the debate on far further than anything uh, we could have imagined a year ago. Um, then I wouldn't disagree with that. And actually what you said about protests is really, really important because it puts the people who it concerns at the center. And when we're talking about decentering um, colonial narratives and making sure that mar marginalized people have a voice, protest should, be also, should also be considered to some extent. And so I'm actually gonna come to you, um, Nana. I read an, a Vogue article actually about your work um, on the Cultural Encyclopedia. Uh, which is an online resource which reorders knowledge and narratives and representations from and about Africa. Um, and so we've spoken about the importance of decentering colonial narratives. Why then is it important to center marginalized voices or colonized subjects in, in the, the art we showcase or the knowledge we produce or even, you know, form the way we, we you know, um, protest or the way we, we, we share our own experiences um, and feelings about certain objects or, or knowledge. Why is it important to center those marginalized voices? Why should we have a voice? You're muted, sorry. My dog was barking, that's why I'm muted, thanks Al. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I, it, it's interesting that you asked that because I remember when your when your the message first came through about the Museum of British Colonialism. I actually have a slightly problematic um, relationship with the idea of you know decolonizing the curriculum, decolonizing this and that because for me it actually centers the idea of colonization when I'm actually about. Um, expanding, or well, the work that I'm doing is about expanding the notion of, of history beyond the colonial. Yeah. So I, for example, you know, in Ghana, when we talk about our historical phases, we talk about the pre-colonial, the colonial and the post-colonial. And the colonial sits at the center of that. And I, you know, I just don't understand that. We have a history that spans thousands and thousands of years. Um, some of it documented in books, a lot of it documented orally. Um, in, you know, different ways through, um, you know, des design in so many different ways. And the Culture Encyclopedia, um, you know, which, which is a kind of halfway between an academic and, a, and an artistic work, is very much about um, re-narrativizing, um, I guess, in the sense in which the colonial um, is linked to it, it it's that you know, the, you know, when, you know, William was just talking now about reading the documents on their own terms that were written at the time, um, there was so much an agenda of control by denouncement, control by, you know, telling us our, um, our histories don't matter, our, our, our artistic products don't matter, our re religions or knowledge systems are primitive, you know, the words that still ring in our ears today, especially in the kind of hyper-religious societies that some of us inhabit, you know, um, fetishistic, primitive, um, you know, the whole kind of semantics of, of what we've been called and what our histories have been called. And yeah. so, you know, that to me is the kind of where the colonial is centered in that particular project of, yeah. of humiliation or undignifying us um, and and to me that kind of redignification comes in the longer picture in the centuries and centuries and centuries of you know cultural wealth and of production and of knowledge systems um, that you know have been ongoing and, and have been ongoing you know I hear so many times that 
um, oh, you know, we've lost so much. We've, you know, lost so much. I don't think we have in the little research that I've done, um, you know, I've un been uncovering and continue to uncover a lot. Um, and so to answer your question about why is it important, you know, why is it, why would it not be important? Um, you know, why would, you know, what, why would what we have evolved over so many years, you know, ways of interacting with nature or the environment or, um, you, you know, tech technologies that we've developed, why would they not be important? Why wouldn't we want to gift those to the world? You know, I, I just, to, to me, it's just, it's, it's a, it's, it's a um, crazy question in a way. Um, and it's crazy that, Sorry. That, um, that um, it would even be posed. And I think yeah. that's, that might be a little bit still the colonial hang up. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, through projects like Charles, through projects like the encyclopedia, you know, the next generation hopefully won't have to live with those kinds of questions. Yeah, definitely. And, and I'm coming to Chow now, um, thinking about the Museum of British Colonialism. And, and we're talking about, you know, should there be a need for a building? And I'm thinking about access and participation. We've spoken about why it's important that our stories are told and that they're told in the right way. Um, I'm also thinking about museum spaces, which often feel like white spaces and very unsafe. For, for marginalized people. In terms of access and participation, what are your thoughts there um, in regards to museums? Uh, thanks Renee, and maybe just to speak a little bit to what Nana said about just the semantics of what we grow up hearing, you know. Um, I think Chimamanda talks about the danger of a single story and how dangerous it is to believe in one version of something. Um, but, then I, but then I think there's also the burden of a single story and the weight of it, you know, the weight that you carry around having been defined by this single story, you know, it's it's almost crippling, you know, you don't have space to think about anything else. Your entire existence is built around navigating this space and navigating this story. So when we ask why why is it important to decenter um, European paradigms, I think for, for me personally, it's freeing. I have much more space yeah. to create. I have much more space to build. I have much more space to speak to my own experience. And uh, just to give you an example, when we started the project, uh, MBC, one of the things that we we're looking at was archives. And um, just uh, the fact that many, many archives and records were either burnt, destroyed, or shipped off to the UK from Kenya. And what does that mean for me? Uh, 27 year old Kenyan who wants to go to the archives. I can't find anything. Um, I need uh, at least three months bank statement and proof of, of, my, of my job and that I will come back to Kenya if I want to visit the UK. In essence, these archives, these records that are centered on European paradigms are inaccessible to us. And it really forced us to shift the way we think about um, knowledge production, to mm -hmm. shift the way we think about the sources that we're using. Uh, so what we did is that we began looking at uh, very deliberately at oral histories, but then yeah. taking oral histories further and saying what assets can we create yeah. when there's no um, when there's no evidence in the record or when that's that's inaccessible or biased, then we look for the evidence in the land in the people. You know what stories do they hold and freeing ourselves from the grasp and the <laughs> the chokehold of of the colonial archive really allowed us to look into personal experiences. It allowed us to look at uh, participation as a very important part of the museum. It allowed us to look at what assets we create, how these assets are made accessible. Are they on free platforms? Are they on places that people can find them? Are they searchable? Are they usable? Um, so I think in essence, the shifting of, of uh, and the decentering of the European uh, systems and thoughts also goes hand in hand with access and it goes hand in hand with participation and it, and it goes hand in hand with um, the provision of a platform that people can use to tap into their own experiences. One of the most interesting things uh, that we've encountered is how much people are willing to share, especially here in Kenya. Whenever we have an event, whenever we share something on social media, there'll always be someone saying, actually, this happened to my grandfather. 
actually, this is my grandfather's uh, colonial passbook, which limited how far he could move in his own country, you know. So it's not even just about tapping into our own archives, uh, tapping into national archives or established system, but what do people have at home? What do people have in their in their hearts, in their experience, and bringing that to the forefront. I think when, when we think about decentering European paradigms, practically, that's what it looks like to us. Yes, I love that, that's wonderful. And it makes me think about, you know, I actually get asked this question a lot. A lot of people feel that a museum of this kind, a museum of British empire, that tells the violent, brutish, or traumatic and disturbing stories, the histories, um, will be an uncomfortable space. And I, I, I want to now open this next question to all of the panelists, um, thinking about the disservice that we do to those who have suffered under British rule when we water down the story to make others comfortable. I want to ask each of you, and if you could um, limit your responses to about two minutes each, do you think there is a need for audience discomfort and how do we engage with the uncomfortable? Any of you and all of you. <laughs> I'll go. I mean, I think I think discomfort and unease is pretty fundamental to learning um, and to growing. Uh, and there is really no way around that. Um, and I, I, but what I will say is that I find that my students, by and large, younger people, um, are quite keen to be exposed to difficulty and discomfort, albeit in a relatively safe space. Um, I, you know, my, my first years and I discussed James Baldwin's um, The Fire Next Time last week, and, and they were raring to discuss it. They were raring to have a discussion about contemporary race. They were nervous and they told me they were nervous, uh, but said that they were very keen to do it and to kind of be nervous while doing it. So yeah. um, I think that, you know, we underrate discomfort and, and unease. I think people um, are more open to it uh, than we think. But let me, let me slightly also say, I know, I know you said two minutes, but let me, let me just quickly say that being uncomfortable also applies to the formerly colonized and their descendants, because the picture of colonialism was not just one of bad colonizer, noble colonized. Um, there are those in our societies who, collaborated and did yeah, so yeah. quite actively and benefited and not everybody was colonized in the same way and when the I, I guess I, I totally get what Nana is saying in terms of lost knowledges and talking about you know what Ghana or Nigeria gave to the world but when I look at what's happening in India where that is actually being weaponized and it's being it is it that kind of discourse of, you know, India has given a lot of things to the world, you know, yoga or meditation or whatever, has been weaponized and is, and is being used for a different kind of cultural project and superiority and colonization. So I think we have to find a way to, to do this with our knees, to recover our lost legacies, but not in a smug way, but to also remember to be uncomfortable about the tyrannies and injustices in our own pasts, because those have not gone away either. I I agree. I think I think that people are open to being made uncomfortable. You only have to think of the Holocaust museums around the world to think of how uh, uh, open people are to going to hear a very disturbing bit of history. I mean, a lot of history is disturbing, and a lot of colonial history is incredibly disturbing. Um, but I don't think that would put people off. And certainly, you know, the Holocaust museums plural and the, and the concentration camps are full of people being moved, being uh, reading terrible things and, and being upset and having nightmares afterwards. But these are things people need to know. Uh, and uh, in, I mean, I feel very strongly that, that this is something that particularly the, uh, the colonizers need to know. British kids need to know that their ancestors did this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and at the moment, the, the version that's being taught, they get this, this sort of, fantasy land whereby uh, the, they, they study um, the, the, the liberation of the slaves as a British achievement, 
and then they move to Florence Nightingale, and then they fight the Nazis in the Second World War. And it's as if the whole of British history is about is, is about liberation and uh, uh, and and equality and uh, and egalitarianism. Uh, and and, these, and kids need to know this. What's very striking, I think, is that when, when British kids go abroad, they meet people from if they're going to Ireland who know the potato famine. They go to Australia, they meet people who know about the Tasmanians. They go to India and they discover the Raj wasn't a merchant ivory film. And at the moment, we're producing generations of kids who are just simply not equipped to travel. Mm. They just never heard the other side of the story. And, and this is a way of sorting it out. One other thing, just to add, I, there's been questions coming up about the biases of collections and, and the biases of the archives. One of the things I've been very struck with working in South Asia is how rich the uh, the, the archives are in, in non-colonial material, particularly stuff in Urdu and Persian. Now, Persian was the language of government for 600 years in India, but it's a language that virtually no one except a very a, a ever diminishing handful of scholars can speak uh, or read. And sitting in the National Archives in Delhi and Pune and Lahore and uh, right over South Asia, there are these enormous unread archives uh, of, of non-colonial, anti-colonial, uh, of often extremely uh, revealing uh, materials which have never been translated. And, uh, and, and it is possible to recreate both sides of the story. You're not stuck only with a, colon with, with a colonial archive which, with all its inherent biases. There are, certainly in the South Asian context, huge quantities uh, of, of anti-colonial, non-colonial material which can be brought into play and tell the other side. Uh, and and the, the, uh, the, the, the use of that material has, has barely begun. When I was working on the anarchy, we, they were bringing out swathes of leather-bound books from 18th century India, written usually by, uh, by uh, Mughal historians, but there are uh, historians of all backgrounds in there, and, and none of them have been translated. There's, in the British Library catalog, there's five or six lines about each enormous history, uh, and, and there's work for generations to come reclaiming those voices. There's also a huge amount of artwork, which has just been stuck into the bottom of museums and never shown. Um, I curated a show uh, last year called Forgotten Masters, which was painting by uh, Indian artists working for colonial uh, 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 commissioners. And the art had always been known as company school art, as if the people, as if it was done by company artists, but it wasn't. It was done by great Indian artists whose names had never been searched, never been shown, and were sitting in British public collections unseen. There's a huge amount of that sort of stuff that can be dredged up. Uh, and put on display and should be put on display. Can I say, I, I actually find it very incredible how, how you're discussing um, access because one thing that came to mind is, um, you know, you, you've spoken about how you've had access to certain archives, um, but, but allowing there to be some transparency in this conversation, um, it is important to address the fact that very, very few former colonies have had access to some of the archives that you've had access to as a white British male. Do you think that's fair? Well, these, these, are, these are archives largely in India where I live. Um, uh, and they're, they're open to any researcher that, I mean, it's true that you can't just walk in, but it's, it's uh, anyone that can produce a, you know, a university or a publisher's thing, then uh, they can, I mean, I'm not, this, isn't a, this is an archive in Delhi, not one in London. But yes, I mean, the, but your point taken, yeah, white, a white British male has, has it easier in a variety of ways. No question of that. Yes. And I want to open now to... Um, Sorry, Jay. Um, just to briefly speak on discomfort. Yeah. I think there's different types of discomforts. Um, there's a discomfort of not knowing what your ancestors did. And there's also the discomfort of not knowing what your ancestors went through. And I think um, as, as a maybe third, fourth generation Kenyan, dealing with the discomfort of not knowing has been a very interesting uh, process personally and within MBC space, um, because there's a lot of guilt that comes with sitting down with someone who you've, you've, you've known, whether your grandparent or a parent, and not necessarily understanding their story. Um, so it's been interesting to encounter those levels of discomfort, which are very important. Um, but I think also contribute to the process of doing this work in itself. Yes. Can I just also say something about discomfort? I actually want to say, uh, say something um, kind of off the back of what Priya said. Um, 
and and that's the kind of notion of um, you know that not everyone suffered at the hands of colonialism in equal ways. Um, you know, and there's hierarchies and privileges that still exist even within our societies, let alone, you know, between our societies. Um, and so that discomfort, you know, when I look, for example, at colonial times, you know, my grandfather or my forefathers were in positions of leadership at the time. And in, you know, in exchange and, and relations with governors that came, um, you know, one of my uncles is called Gugisberg <laughs> after like one of the English, uh, you know, he's called Uncle Googie, like, the, you know, after one of the English governors and you, you know, you have to then, there's a, there's a kind of discomfort in also asking yourself, you know, to what extent were, you know, pe of us, people of us either complicit or, you know, um, supportive of policies that were damaging to ourselves. There's not just a discomfort, I think, between societies, between, for example, the colonized and the colonizer. There's also the, the discomfort that we have within our own societies. Um, you know, you, we, when, when we ask about slavery here in Ghana, you know, we have obviously there's a lot of silence as part of our historicization. It's just part of, of how we historicize. We historicize through um, sound and through silence. But there's so much silence. There's so much... Um, kind of almost like willful amnesia about that particular chapter of slavery, I think because of pain, um, but also um, discomfort. And so there's also, you know, the question of, and that's something that I've had to deal with a lot, like trying to go back into these histories. How can I do this in a way that's respectful? How can I do this in a way that, um, you know, that I'm not just coming in saying, I need to know this now um, in a way yeah, that honors kind of those histories and those narratives and those people. So there's a discomfort, but there's also an honoring um, and also a kind of acknowledgement of privilege um, that doesn't just come between colonizer and colonized, but also within, within the colonized, there's these hierarchies that still exist to this day. Um, and that still, you know, I, for example, have a certain platforms and narratives because of, you know, places that I was had access to or was educated in. Um, and I think, you know, we still to this day, not just in the past, but also in the present, need to continuously, you know, in a way, uh, be humble and acknowledge um, and be in discomfort, not just about the past, but about the continuing present, the continuing colonizations that happen. Um, yeah. Yes. So would, would I review or any of you, um, think that then, do any of you think that there needs to be uh, more emphasis on museums as emotional spaces or transitional, you know, spaces for transitional justice and not just physical spaces uh, to house objects? And, and in thinking of that question um, as, you know, museums as uh, spaces for justice and spaces, you know, that are emotional, can a museum of British colonialism that seeks such an uncomfortable reckoning with the past also be a space for social healing? Any I think more? it has to be at like 100%. For, for me, that's kind of, at least from my point of view, that for me is actually almost the primary goal of museum making from my yeah. practice is, yeah. is healing. I think um, definitely also. Um, and even speaking to the question of emotion, we ask ourselves, what are we when we don't have emotions? Are we still human? You know, can we, what makes us human? You know, and, and if emotions are what gives us the essence of our humanity, then why shouldn't this be plugged into a space that is speaking about our humanity? So in terms of looking at whether it's important to have emotion within the museum space, I think um, definitely a hundred percent, yeah. I just want to slightly um, say, yes, uh, healing is important, but because of the elections in America, for instance, it's a word that's being thrown around quite a lot and it's being thrown around. Um, it's being thrown around without much uh, thinking about it, which is it's being thrown around in the sense of, OK, now the election's over, everybody get back together and heal. Um, and again, with 
with healing, we are talking about processes that were deeply violent and damaging over years. I mean, even just this election alone, we've had, you know, four years of white supremacy in the United States. We've had deep racism, deep violence against black people in the US. Healing can't be achieved overnight. I know no one here is, is saying that, but I'm just talking about the, the uses of the word healing. Um, I think we need to talk really about justice in the first instance, about reparative justice, about um, you know making good some of the uh, losses of history and some of the uh, you know in inequalities of the present, and then we can talk about healing as a kind of long-term process that begins uh, with justice. But I think we have to be a little bit careful about the idea that you would, you know, you might go into some place and, and something is there and then you just come out healed. Um, and again, this is not anything anyone here is saying, but I think there is a kind of slightly banal notion of healing, particularly around race and colonialism that floats around where it's like, okay, how do I feel better now? Uh, in, you, that, you, you're probably too young to remember the 2007 uh, abolition of slavery uh, commemoration. I mean, some of that was just toe curlingly dreadful. Uh, you know, people walking from one end of the country to the, uh, the other wearing t-shirts saying, I'm so sorry. Uh, and then you just think, you know, who is the spectacle for and whose healing are we talking about without actual discussions of justice? Hmm, that's a really important question. I think in the context of Britain, in the sense that before you can get any healing, you've got to have an awareness uh, of what's been done, which simply isn't the case yet. Uh, yeah. If you compare it, say, to Germany, where the Germans yeah. are taught everything about the Holocaust. And so, you know, the current generation of Germans can, can you know, learn about it and move on. But we haven't, you know, we haven't even got to the beginning of this process in Britain. There's only the beginning of an awareness of what's happened. It's beginning to turn, uh, and 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 you're seeing it accelerating. I mean, there is far more discussion about it now than there was five years ago. And there's the uh, the books that are coming out are far angrier now than they were five years ago. Uh, I think things are changing, but you have to have before you can have a healing. You've got to have an acknowledgement. You've got to have an education, and yeah. none of that's happened yet. We're you know we're way down the, the we're way down the road. Uh, we're right at the beginning of the road. We haven't even got anywhere near the kind of resolution and healing and moving on stage. We have to have the discovery. Uh, the That's very true. Because if I think about, you know, any trauma that someone may experience and how they they get on a on a on you know the journey of of healing, the process of healing, you first have to acknowledge the hurt um, before you can go through the other stages. So there it is a process, um, and we are tight for time. So. I am actually going to pause this conversation right now and turn to questions from our audience. We've got a lot of questions coming in um, and I'm gonna try and get through as many as possible. Um, so the first one is from Ellen from Canterbury. Uh, Ellen asks, with some museums removing objects such as the Pitt Rivers, what meaningful dialogue can be created in the absence of these objects? Wait, absence from us in Africa or from the West? Like, that's a very loaded question. Yes, so with some museums removing objects, what meaningful dialogue can be created in the absence of these objects? Well, I mean, the objects are already absent. They're, it, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. A, it's a crazy question. It's, I no, mean, that's I, a I very think... kind of situated question. What I think she meant was that in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, there were colonial trophies, including human heads, on display. I know what she meant. Yeah. You know, I just think but, it's a very loaded question. It's a very, I mean, I hear the argument again and again is from this one side point of view, um, which is exactly what the problem is with Western and imperialist museums, which is that they're always only seeing their point of view and in, in, in complete disregard of what the other side is. You know, the flip side of that is to say that perhaps it is time for Europe or Britain to be museumized, which is to say objects in Britain. And I mean like even literally a cup of tea put in a, in a case or a bar of chocolate 
and questions asked about how Yorkshire tea even exists, given that tea doesn't grow in Yorkshire. So actually, it, perhaps it isn't the, the objects that are needed are not the objects that were taken from Benin or Ghana or India. Perhaps we should be looking at everyday objects that are deemed to be yeah. British or English or whatever and ask where did these come from and what is their history? Hmm. Well, I, I think... Sorry. No, no, sorry, go ahead. I, I, just, I, I just find it quite interesting that there's a kind of sometimes, yeah, I, I, like for example, with the culture encyclopedia, there are some areas that we have researched. Um, I can't remember, I think it was an area in the central region where every single article that had been written about that particular area had, had really randomly been written only by Italian academics. And we, as we were kind of unearthing this research, we were like, why are they so interested in us? Like, why are they so fascinated by us? And, and I don't know if there's that same kind of obsessive, that reciprocal obsessiveness that we would be as interested in, in putting a cup of tea in a glass box. I don't know if there's that kind of same um, obsessive need to classify and categorize. And, and um, I don't know. No, no, I'm talking about here. I'm talking yeah. about Brits coming to self-understanding and to understand why Yorkshire tea isn't Yorkshire tea and has mm. a long history of labor and extraction and colonialism behind it. There is I, mean, I, think, I think if there was integrity in, in, in what people were doing, maybe, but I, I don't think, I think that kind of presupposes that there is integrity that there wasn't kind of this exercise of othering um, and and of superiority, um, which is which I think is inherent in museums in these kind of so-called universal museums. There is actually a follow-up to this question. So somebody else asked, following on, um, in instances where collections don't contain extensive appropriated physical holdings, so materials that can be uh, repatriated. How can they best support and, con and contribute towards this work? Which again, is quite a big question. Hmm. Well, I, I don't know if, if, I, if um, I'm speaking to this question or the first one, um, but just thinking about the question that what, what conversations do we need to have now that the objects are gone? Yeah. I think to flip it and say, what conversations did were happening when the objects were there, because they're symbolic of something. And um, if if there's a need to talk about their absence, then what impact or what what did their presence do? You know, why was it so important to have them and keep them in these spaces uh, so much so that when they're gone, there needs to be like a counter argument? Um, just thinking of, uh, I sorry, what was the second question? So the second question is, uh, in instances where collections don't contain uh, extensive appropriated uh, physical holdings, how can they best support and contribute this work? So museums, I'm guessing this means in, uh, where, where there are collections uh, or museums that don't contain appropriated uh, objects, how can they best support and contribute to this work? How can how can we, how can you, how can they best support and contribute towards this work? Well, let, me, let me have a think. <laughs> well, I think in, in previous conversations, we've, we've sort of touched on this and answered this. So I'm going to uh, move on for the sake of time. Um, we've got another question from Sharanjit who asks, how will a museum on British colonialism achieve its purpose set against very colonial white museums with so much power in the UK, like the British Museum or the Victoria Albert Museum? So how will it achieve its purpose when it's set against uh, very colonial white museums, which have so much power? And Isn't that one for William? <laughs> well, I think, 
I mean, to go back to Washington, the, the African-American Museum has become uh, the most popular on the map. Uh, it's the one that you have to book a week in advance to get into. Uh, these, because these are untold stories, because these are stories that people want to hear, in a sense, you could argue they have an advantage over the stuffy old ones that people have seen forever and heard a million times. Um, and uh, I, think, I think there's every reason to think that if you were to create a museum, and were to pitch it as well as the African American Museum has been pitched. That you, that this is something which there is a huge hunger to learn about. That this is this is stuff that people really, really want to know. It's really important new stuff. Uh, so I don't think there's any danger at all that it's going to, uh, uh, you know, not have as many visitors as the British Museum or whatever. I, I think on the contrary, I think this has absolutely got the zeitgeist, and it could be, it, as well as very important, extremely popular. Yes. Yes. And um, we've got another question here, um, and it's a really interesting one, actually. Um, this one is, is also directed to you, William. Um, and it's regarding how you describe objects such as shackles. The question is, is this appropriate? So I'm guessing is shackles appropriate in a museum of British colonialism? Who is being moved by these objects? And is this a productive kind of emotional engagement? I'm actually gonna, I will let you respond, William. I'll also, I'm also interested to hear from everybody else as well on this question. Yeah, I mean, obviously it, it, it's a very difficult one and, and you have to approach these things with huge sensitivity. Yeah. Um, uh, ditto, you know, a Holocaust museum. Uh, it, these things have to be thought through incredibly carefully, how, how the story is told, who's telling it and, and so on. These, these are deeply sensitive matters. Um, but I think, as we've said earlier, that the that that it's important to make people uncomfortable, um, particularly the, the 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 former colonizers. If if we're talking about the version of this museum which would be in Britain rather than a, a, you know in a sense you'd need a completely different sort of museum for one in 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 Ghana or Kenya to the sort of museum you'd need to educate the former colonizers, and um, I I think it's extremely important. That something shocking, that, that shocking objects are in this museum, because otherwise, people will continue to believe in the the merchant ivory gin fizz smiling Maharaja version of colonialism, which which is tragically still the general view. Yeah. Does anybody want to respond to that as well? I think it's it's interesting for us because we've never actually seen uh, NBC. I mean, NBC being this project as uh, possessing any objects. We've actually never envisioned it as being a space that actually we collect objects. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it also goes back to the question of emotion and um, being a space where we problematize the idea of a museum, but also introduce new stories. And in that way, seeking to sort of like subvert the idea of a museum as this very physical, very tangible space um, and look, focus more on the human experience and the human perspective to this one event. A lot of the work that we've done and I think we continue to do is around um, knowledge production and looking at the museum as a space that actively encourages knowledge production, not just from um, experts or people who, who would necessarily be working in history, but also encouraging people to work within their spaces. So if it means um, creating like an oral history toolkit that people could use that is divorced from us as an institution, but we could share this with people who can then go out and do their own work. So I think the empowerment in, in, in um, creating a museum of this nature is not so much in holding the objects, but in holding the stories and, and hosting creating a space where people can come and share these stories. Because it's interesting because we could, all, we could all be sitting in the same room, knowing the same thing, but until one person brings up the subject, then you have no way to either con contribute or dialogue. So looking at dialogue and collaboration as an inherent part of, of a museum such as this. Mm. We have a, a, a few more minutes left, so I'm gonna throw in a few more questions. This next one, I think, is going to be a really interesting one um, for everyone. Uh, the concept of museums is a Eurocentric colonial concept that has no place in some cultures. How do we remove, how do we remove the muse from the institution? Ooh. 
I mean, I sort of think we've touched on that, that, that it's, it's certainly from what both Nana and Chao were saying, that there are you know, different conceptualizations of museums as a reframing of how we think about them as having stories rather than objects, as going into communities, uh, not necessarily tied up to a building, not necessarily putting objects in a static collection. But maybe the practitioners have better thoughts. No, I think I think you summarized it uh, perfectly, Priya. But I think Nana is trying to say something. Mike is muted. Muted. Oh yes, yeah, you're muted. Sorry. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I think that um, we there are so many interesting. I mean, museum in in the end of the day is is just it's a descriptive word. Um, but we have. I mean, holders of culture in a way within that are, have grown within our context. For example, we have a fashion, what we call a fashion, which is translated as festival, even though that's not an apt translation. It, the the um, the exact translation is when the year ends, so the the the, the meeting of the year. Um, and in those fashion, we have um, objects that have been around for hundreds of years that come out. We have. Um, performance, we have design, we have reenactment. Um, and in a way, they're these kind of living dynamic museums. They might not be, and they do take place in the same place, which is not um, boundaried by walls, but it is a kind of space of sorts. And so I think it depends on how, you know, it's, it's a word museum, but the idea of having a space that holds culture that people can come into in order to exchange, in order to learn, um, in order to pass on is something that exists. And so how we you know, choose to conceptualize or how to hold that um, is something that um, it, it is up to each context in a way. I, I don't think we can just turn you know, in this process of kind of re-narrativizing, just turn our backs on, um, on museums wholesale. I think it's interesting in a way to take, you know, that's a, a huge privilege, again, to be able to take from all of these different places and say, what do we want to create? You know, what do we want to create out of what's been passed down within our context for centuries? And then what's come in, um, in the last 60 years, you know, do we want to create something new or something um, hybrid out of that. And I think that's the moment that we're at now. And I think that's what we're seeing in all these little pockets across the continent, at least, is these experimentations, these kind of um, trying out of new forms. And, and it, it, I, th I think it's quite an exciting space to be in. Very exciting. And, and coming on the back of what you're saying about experimentation. Oh, sorry, Will, did you have something that you want to add? Yeah, I just say that while the idea of museums may be something colonial and Eurocentric, thing, there are things which are universal. Narrative is universal. Storytelling is universal. Remembering the past is universal. And exposing evil is universal. And, and, and these are the, in a sense, it seems to me this is the nub of the thing. And, and that's not something Eurocentric. This is something everyone can, can, can participate in, whatever the culture, whatever the country. Hmm. So yes, it's, it's accessible to everybody. Everybody can participate it, participate in it. And I'm going to come back to uh, what you were saying, Nana, about experimentation and the new forms that people are, you know, practicing. Um, and so we've we've come to the end now. There are so much more questions that that I would love to ask you all. So many people had so many wonderful questions, um, and that just goes to show that this is and this should be an on, an ongoing conversation. You know, we we can't get through thing in one sitting. Um, so I'm going to ask you all uh, for your final thoughts on how we all or how you specifically would imagine um, a Museum of British Colonialism um, and really thinking about going forward in our practice or in our activities. So just closing thoughts on how you would imagine a Museum of British Colonialism. If we start with Priya. Okay, I'm probably the least qualified um, to comment on this. So I might slightly dodge the question to, to make a point that I think is relevant. Um, Will began today by talking about the East India Company and how the East India Company was central to the colonial project. And I think that that is a very important point. 
But it's an important point that leads us to a second important point, which is colonialism is not dead. In as much as the East India Corporation was, as Nick Robin says, the, the world's first great multinational corporation, we live in an era where multinational corporations still run the states we live in and the world as we know it. So the question of museumizing colonialism becomes complicated when we remember that colonialism hasn't gone away. It's, its locus has shifted, the forms it takes, the names it gives itself uh, have shifted, but we live in a corporate capitalist age. So talking about museumizing colonialism in a sense is already by definition uh, problematic because here we are, our lives, the borders, our politics, our politicians run by big corporations and corporate money and corporate scandals in the way that the East India Company had them and corporate mistreatment, corporate ruining of environments of you know, exploitation of labor. So where is the question of museumizing this stuff? Mm, much to think about. I can see, <laughs> I can see that Will is raring to respond. So I'm gonna ask him next for his uh, closing thoughts or a response to that. No, I, I just agreeing. I'm just I'm nodding my head. I just, if, you know, if you think of the late 20th century with, I suppose, the Anglo-Persian oil company overturning Mossadegh's government in Iran, the only democratically elected government in Iran, if you think of the United Fruit Company uh, creating a coup with the CIA to topple the socialist governments in uh, Guatemala, producing the phrase Banana Republic in the process, if you think of the CIA operating with ITT and bringing down IND in Chile. If you think of Exxon Mobil, uh, the still hazy story of what their role was or wasn't with the Bush government and the invasion of Iraq. These are ongoing colonial stories in the present. Uh, and and Priya is quite right. This, this is not a story that is, that is over. Uh, this is not the past. This is, in a way, the present. Yes, definitely. Um, Nana, what are your final thoughts? And, and taking it back to imagining your imagination of uh, a museum of, of British colonialism, if you could sum it up how, how you would describe it, what would your words be? Um, I think it would be to rethink the idea of, of, of a museum, um, to rethink of the idea of a museum as a kind of monument to the past, a static monument to the past where we go and observe from a distance. Um, if, you know, if there was to be such a thing as, as museums or pluralistic museums of British colonialism, think about them as dynamic centers um, in a way where, um, you know, it, it's not just one building necessarily, maybe one building is part of it, but that there's a building, there's um, engagement with communities, there's rethinking of existing, um, monuments and 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 ways of and and not not um, tangible things, but as something that's pluralistic um, and open ended. And Chow, you get the last word. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think we often uh, in conversations within the team we speak about how colonialism is uh, visibly invisible, you know, in that it is uh, everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Yeah. It's, it's hard to trace, it's, it's shape-shifting. And I think what Priya, Priya said is, is, is a challenge for us as a group um, about looking how we speak about colonialism, how we museumize it uh, per se, but also thinking of uh, what's happening today and how it's affecting us um, in our day-to-day -day lives. Um, in terms of what that would look like for me, I think looking just generally at uh, history, but also the museum as an active process, as a continuing process, uh, as an experiment. I love that word because it, it, I think what we're doing now, it, it feels like an experiment. We don't know if you're succeeding. We don't know if we're, you know, only time will tell what impact this work will have. Um, so to be open, to be a space that is also open to emotion to vulnerability, to pain, you know, to um, dialogue. I think there are many things that uh, that could look like, but in essence, a space that centers the human experience and the human understanding of what colonialism is, as opposed to centering um, objects or um, physical spaces. Mm -hmm. 
A space that centers real human experience. I love that. Um, so we've come to the end, um, unfortunately, of what has been a very profound and, and insightful conversation. So I want to thank Priya, I want to thank Will, Nana, Chow. Thank you all so much for engaging with me um, in such a delightful way. Um, there have been moments where there have been disagreements and it's been handled so well and so beautifully. So thank you all um, so much. Um, I, 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 I want to bring attention back to the Museum of British Colonialism. You can check out their website, www.museumofbritishcolonialism.org, and you can follow them on Twitter, museum of, at Museum of BC. Um, I'm now going to hand back to uh, one of the other co-founders of the Museum um, of British Colonialism. Olivia, are you there? Yeah, I have nothing to say other than thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 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 no, thanks all for coming. Um, have a nice evening, night, uh, morning, wherever you are. And I really hope that we can continue to have these conversations because it's very enriching and dynamic. And I appreciate you all. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.